Is the Apple M3 Pro a scam? Well, it really depends upon how much you understand the two key factors that make a difference between the M3 Pros and the M1 and M2 Pros. We'll first start off with memory because I'm sure you've heard a lot about memory, especially with the M3 Pro variants coming out and hearing about the 25% reduction in memory bandwidth. What does that all exactly mean and how does it determine the performance? Well, I'm gonna try to explain this very simplified, but try to explain sort of this whole thing here. So let's talk about all of the M variants, the M1 Pro, M2 Pro, and M3 Pro. They all had the same type of memory, which is LPDDR5 memory that it uses, and they all run at 6,400 mega transfers per second on the Pro version of these. Basically, that mega transfers per second basically means how fast it can send data between memory and all different components within the system, because there's a lot of different factors here. Like I said, I'm simplifying this down. Now, in terms of the bandwidth, the bandwidth basically means how how much data that you can send up and down at a time. Now on the M1 Pro and M2 Pro, you have a 256 bit memory bus, which allows for 200 gigabits per second of data that you can send up and down all around through the components on the system. But on the M3 Pro, that actually got reduced by 25% to 192 bit bus, which gives you 150 gigabits per second of memory of data speed that you can just transfer up and down. That is a limitation right there. And that's basic computing. There's nothing that could kind of automatically make that different. You can't just flip a switch or make an update and just switch that automatically. That is gonna be set at the way that it is. And this can really determine for some apps out there. A lot of people that I know that have MacBook Pros, including myself, are on the creative side. So they're using a lot of heavy data assets, uh, even people that use like sort of heavy Excel models, 3D modeling, all sort of different things that require a lot of memory and a lot of files that need to exist in memory because when you're using RAM and memory that's really where all your components are apps everything is sort of running and where you before you kind of save and interact with all the components within the system like I said I'm simplifying this down but memory is very very important and I know you hear about unified memory architecture and all that really sort of means is that the components the GPU and the CPU especially the GPU all use the same RAM instead of having independent RAM themselves you just see independent RAM and things like graphics cards that go inside Windows PCs, and they typically run specialized RAM that run a whole lot faster, typically faster than the RAM that's sort of what you're seeing here in the MacBook Pros and other sort of basic computer systems. Now, I don't care what anyone says, you can have as much memory as you want on here. You can shoot it all the way up to the maximum, but if your bandwidth is limited, it isn't going to matter. It's going to be a bottleneck. There's going to be some type of slowness there with that compared to the other models that we saw if they were 200 gigabits of speed. It, it, that's just basic computing one-on-one. -on -one. Now, that isn't the only thing that determines a lot of this. There's a lot of different factors, but I do want to talk about the second factor here, which is talking about the CPUs and how they're sort of configured between the M1, M2, and M3 Pro variants, because there's some interesting things here with this as well, too. Let's go ahead and take a look at here. So I have listed all the M1 variants that you can see right here between the 8 core, 10 core, 11 core, and 12 core. 11 core is such a weird thing to say, but they're all right there. And you'll see something called p &E on here, which is uh, performance versus efficiency. So cores are basically broken down between performance cores, which are things that do the heavy loaded tasks, those powerful things that you need to get done. And the efficiency cores are sort of those light, easy tasks that it can kind of do and do them very effectively, efficiently while saving power. Now, if you take a look between the M1 Pro and M2 Pro, you'll typically see in the core variants that there is usually more performance cores than efficiency cores. But if you take a look at the M3 variants, that's a little bit different where there are less performance cores and more efficiency cores, particularly in the 11 core model, which has five performance cores and six efficiency cores, and the M3 Pro evens it out at six performance and six efficiency. This can make a difference as well too, depending upon the apps that you're using and whatnot. If you need something that really needs a lot of performance cores, you're not gonna have as many in the M3 Pros versus you have with the M1 and M2. Now, apps can optimize obviously, and core technology, what they do in terms of design do change year to year to year but that isn't always sort of the determining factor. Sometimes more cores are just needed for the app or the task that you're doing in hand. And when you take a look at the M3 Pro variants, you're getting less of that on here. What I've really seen them do here with the M3 family between the Pro and the Max is that they really push you to go get the Max version to get the 
full memory bandwidth and to get the better performance for efficiency core count and you're kind of almost penalized a little bit in getting the M3 Pro because they're doing a little bit less. Yes, like I said, the technology could be a little bit different, a little bit more effective, efficient, but so these are the things that you just want to keep in mind. I'm not saying that the M3 Pro is a bad product by any sort of means. What I want you to sort of get out of this is understanding what the differences are between all of these processes. So when you're taking a look at reviews and benchmarks, you have this knowledge to know what you're sort of looking at and what to expect. So you can make sure you make a good qualified buying decision for yourself yourself in determining if you should go for an M3 Pro, should you try to get an M1, or you should try to get an M2, or you should go up to M3 Max. They're all good options, but I want to make sure that you are looking at these in the right way. Now, I didn't talk too much about the GPU cores, only because if you really need to use something that's going to take a lot of GPU power with it, you're probably looking at the max variant of these processors anyway, versus what you see here inside of the M3 Pro. But the M3 Pro is good enough for the basics in terms of video editing, 4K editing, and the media engines really taking do a good job of kind of helping you with that. But these things that I talked about in terms of the memory and CPU are really the most important parts and really what affect your performance on a day-to-day -day basis when using your MacBook Pro. So I just want you to make sure you're getting the right stuff and, and taking a look at this versus the competition, which I do talk about some good competition coming from the Snapdragon X Elite from Qualcomm. In the video, I'll have linked in the description below. And we're gonna see some stuff here in the Windows space to compete here against the Mac space. So I'm really excited to see that. But hopefully this has helped you out a lot and hopefully gave you some good knowledge. Questions, comments, concerns, please post them below. Thanks for watching.